Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads. Section 1 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 1. Annabel Lee. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know, by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child, in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and by Annabel Lee. With a love that the winged Saris of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that, long ago in this kingdom by the sea, A wind blew out of a cloud, chilling, my beautiful Annabel Lee. So that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre, in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was a reason, as all men know in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee, and the stars never rise but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tide I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. End of section 1. Annabel Lee Section 2 of Miscellaneous Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Helen Taylor, Oxford, UK. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 2. The Bells. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells. What a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in their icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight, from the molten golden notes and all in tune, what a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells! How it swells! How it dwells on the future! How it tells of the rapture that impels to the swinging and the ringing of the bells, 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 of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells. What a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek, out of tune. 
in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire, and a resolute endeavour, now, now, to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, bells, bells! What a tale their terror tells, of despair! How they clang and clash and roar! What a horror they outpour, on the bosom of the palpitating air! Yet the ear it fully knows, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells, in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamour and the clangour of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone, and who toiling, 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 in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling, on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human, they are ghouls. And their king it is who tolls, and he rolls, 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 a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances, and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the paean of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the moaning and the groaning of the bells. End of section two. The Bells. Section three of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 3. El Dorado. Gaily bedight, a gallant knight, in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song, in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow, fell as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow. Ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. End of section 3. El Dorado. Section 4 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 4. The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this and nothing more.' 
Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain, thrilled me filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before so that now to still the beating of my heart i stood repeating tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door this it is and nothing more presently my soul grew stronger hesitating then no longer sir said i or madame truly your forgiveness i implore but the fact is i was napping and so gently you came rapping and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore this i whispered and an echo murmured back the word lenore merely this and nothing more back into the chamber turning all my soul within me burning soon i heard again a tapping somewhat louder than before surely said i surely that is something at my window lattice let me see then what there at is and this mystery explore let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore tis the wind and nothing more open here i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore not the least obeisance made he not an instant stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answered little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour nothing further then he uttered not a feather then he fluttered till i scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore. Till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore, Of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking, fancy under fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press uh, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent thee by the angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from thy memories of lenore 
Quaff, oh, quaff this kind Nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter set or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting, get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of section 4. The Raven Section 5 of Miscellaneous Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe Section 5. The Telltale Heart True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses. Not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How, then, am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily. How calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object? There was none. Passion? There was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye for ever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him, and every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed! to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, Oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray 
fell upon the vulture eye and this i did for seven long nights every night just at midnight but i found the eye always closed and so it was impossible to do the work for it was not the old man who vexed me but his evil eye and every morning when the day broke i went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he has passed the night so you see he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve i looked in upon him while he slept upon the eighth night i was more than usually cautious in opening the door a watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine never before that night had i felt the extent of my own powers of my sagacity i could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there i was opening the door little by little and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts i fairly chuckled at the idea and perhaps he heard me for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled now you may think that i drew back but no his room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers and so i knew that he could not see the opening of the door and i kept pushing it on steadily steadily i had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out who's there i kept quite still and said nothing for a whole hour i did not move a muscle and in the meantime i did not hear him lie down he was still sitting up in the bed listening just as i have done night after night hearkening to the death watches in the wall presently i heard a slight groan and i knew it was the groan of mortal terror it was not a groan of pain or of grief oh no it was the low stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe i knew the sound well many a night just at midnight when all the world slept it has welled up from my own bosom deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me i say i knew it well i knew what the old man felt and pitied him although i chuckled at heart i knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed his fears had been ever since growing upon him he had been trying to fancy them causeless but could not he had been saying to himself it is nothing but the wind in the chimney it is only a mouse crossing the floor or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp yes he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions but he had found all in vain all in vain because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim and it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel although he neither saw nor heard to feel the presence of my head within the room when i had waited a long time very patiently without hearing him lie down i resolved to open a little a very very little crevice in the lantern so i opened it you cannot imagine how stealthily stealthily until at length a simple dim ray like the thread of a spider shot from out the crevice and fell full upon the vulture eye it was open wide wide open and i grew furious as i gazed upon it i saw it with perfect distinctness all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow of my bones but i could see nothing else of the old man's face or person for i had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot and have i not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense now i say there came to my ears a low dull quick sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton i knew that sound well too it was the beating of the old man's heart it increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage but even yet i refrained and kept still i scarcely breathed i held the lantern motionless i tried how steadily i could maintain the ray upon the eye meantime 
the hellish tattoo of the heart increased it grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant the old man's terror must have been extreme it grew louder i say louder every moment do you mark me well i have told you that i am nervous so i am and now at the dead hour of the night amid the dreadful silence of that old house so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror yet for some minutes longer i refrained and stood still but the beating grew louder louder i thought the heart must burst and now a new anxiety seized me the sound would be heard by a neighbor the old man's hour had come with a loud yell i threw open the lantern and leaped into the room he shrieked once once only in an instant i dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him i then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done but for many minutes the heart beat on with a muffled sound this however did not vex me it would not be heard through the wall <sighs> at length it ceased the old man was dead i removed the bed and examined the corpse yes he was stone stone dead i placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes there was no pulsation he was stone dead his eye would trouble me no more if still you think me mad you will think so no longer when i describe the wise precautions i took for the concealment of the body the night waned and i worked hastily but in silence first of all i dismembered the corpse i cut off the head and the arms and the legs i then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings i then replaced the board so cleverly so cunningly that no human eye not even his could have detected anything wrong there was nothing to wash out no stain of any kind no blood spot whatever i had been too wary for that a tub had caught all <laughs> when i had made an end of these labors it was four o'clock still dark as midnight as the bell sounded the hour there came a knocking at the street door i went down to open it with a light heart for what had i now to fear there entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police a shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night suspicion of foul play had been aroused information had been lodged at the police office and they the officers had been deputed to search the premises i smiled for what had i to fear i bade the gentlemen welcome the shriek i said was my own in a dream the old man i mentioned was absent in the country i took my visitors all over the house i bade them search search well i led them at length to his chamber i showed them his treasures secure undisturbed in the enthusiasm of my confidence i brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while i myself in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim the officers were satisfied my manner had convinced them I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length i found that the noise was not within my ears no doubt i now grew very pale but i talked more fluently and with a heightened voice yet the sound increased and what could i do it was a low dull quick sound much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton i gasped for breath and yet the officers heard it not i talked more quickly more vehemently but the noise steadily increased i arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations but the noise steadily increased why would they not be gone i paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men but the noise steadily increased oh god what could i do i foamed i raved i swore i swung the chair upon which i had been sitting and grated it upon the boards but the noise arose over all and continually increased it grew louder 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled was it possible they heard not almighty oh, god no no they heard they suspected they knew they were making a mockery of my horror this i thought and this i think but anything was better than this agony anything was more tolerable than this derision 
i could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer i felt that i must scream or die and now again hark louder 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 villains i shrieked dissembled no more i admit the deed tear up the planks here here it is the beating of his hideous heart end of section five the tell-tale heart Section six of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section six. Alone. From childhood's hour I have not been as others were, I have not seen, as others saw, I could not bring, my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken my sorrow, I could not awaken, my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still from the torrent or the fountain from the red cliff of the mountain from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view end of section six alone section seven of miscellaneous poe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 7 The Conqueror Worm. Lo, tis a gala night within the lonesome latter years, an angel throng bewinged bedight in veils and drowned in tears sit in a theatre to see a play of hopes and fears while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres mimes in the form of god on high mutter and mumble low and hither and thither fly mere puppets they who come and go at bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro flapping from out their condor wings invisible woe that motley drama oh be sure it shall not be forgot with its phantom chased for evermore by a crowd that sees it not through a circle that ever turneth in to the same self spot and much of madness and more of sin and horror the soul of the plot but see amid the mimic rout a crawling shape intrude a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude it writhes it writhes with mortal pangs the mimes become its food and the angels sob at vermin fangs in human gore imbued out out are the lights out all and over each quivering form the curtain a funeral pall comes down with the rush of a storm 
and the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy, man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. End of section 7. The Conqueror Worm. Section 8 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 8 Evening Star. Twas noontide of summer and midtime of night, and stars in their orbits shone pale through the light of the brighter cold moon. Mid planets her slaves, herself in the heavens, her beam on the waves. I gazed a while on her cold smile, too cold, too cold for me. There passed as a shroud a fleecy cloud, and I turned away to thee, proud evening star, in thy glory afar, and dearer thy beam shall be. For joy to my heart is the proud part thou bearest in heaven at night, and more I admire thy distant fire than that colder, lowly light. End of section 8 Evening Star Section 9 of Miscellaneous Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe Section 9 Fairyland Dim veils and shadowy floods and cloudy-looking woods whose forms we can't discover for the tears that drip all over. Huge moons there wax and wane, Again, again, again. Every moment of the night, Forever changing places, And they put out the starlight With the breath from their pale faces. About twelve by the moon dial, one more filmy than the rest, a kind which, upon trial, they have found to be the best, comes down, still down, and down, with its center on the crown of a mountain's eminence, while its wide circumference in easy drapery falls over hamlets over halls, wherever they may be, o'er the strange woods, o'er the sea, over spirits on the wing, over every drowsy thing, and buries them up quite in a labyrinth of light. And then, how deep, oh, deep, is the passion of their sleep, in the morning they arise, and their moony covering is soaring in the skies with the tempest as they toss, like almost anything, or a yellow albatross. They use that moon no more for the same end as before, videlicent a tent 
which I think extravagant. Its atomies, however, into a shower dissever, of which those butterflies of earth who seek the skies and so come down again never contented thing have brought a specimen upon their quivering wings end of section 9 fairyland section 10 of miscellaneous poe this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Armentrout. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 10 The Haunted Palace. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace raised its head. In the monarch thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious, golden, on its roof did float and flow. This all this was in the olden time long ago and every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day upon the ramparts plumed and pallid a winged odor went away wanderers in that happy valley through two luminous windows saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-timed law round about a throne where sitting pophyrogene in state his glory well befitting the ruler of the realm was seen and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door through which came blowing 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 and sparkling evermore a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate ah let us mourn for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate and round about his house of glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed and travellers now within that valley through the red litten windows see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh but smile no more end of section 10 the haunted palace Section 11 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 11. The Pit and the Pendulum. Impia tortorum longos hic turba furores. Sanguinis inocri non satiata aluit, sospite nunc patria, fracto nunc funeris antro, mors ubi dira fuit vita salusque patent. Quatrain composed for the gates of a market to be erected upon the site of the Jacobean clubhouse at Paris. I was sick, 
sick unto death with that long agony, and when they at length unbound me and I was permitted to sit, I felt that my senses were leaving me. The sentence, the dread sentence of death, was the last of distinct accentuation which reached my ears. After that the sound of the inquisitorial voices seemed merged in one dreamy, indeterminate hum. It conveyed to my soul the idea of revolution, perhaps from its association in fancy with the burr of a mill-wheel. This only for a brief period, for presently I heard no more. Yet, for a while, I saw, but with how terrible an exaggeration, I saw the lips of the black-robed judges. They appeared to me white, whiter than the sheet upon which I traced these words, and thin even to grotesqueness, thin with the intensity of their expression of firmness, of immovable resolution, of stern contempt of human torture. I saw that the decrees of what to me was fate were still issuing from those lips. I saw them writhe with a deadly locution. I saw them fashion the syllables of my name, and I shuddered because no sound succeeded. I saw, too, for a few moments of delirious horror, the soft and nearly imperceptible waving of the sable draperies which enwrapped the walls of the apartment. And then my vision fell upon the seven tall candles upon the table. At first they wore the aspect of charity, and seemed white and slender angels who would save me. But then, all at once, there came a most deadly nausea over my spirit, and I felt every fibre in my frame thrill as if I had touched the wire of a galvanic battery, while the angel forms became meaningless spectres, with heads of flame, and I saw that from them there would be no help. And then there stole into my fancy, like a rich musical note, the thought of what sweet rest there must be in the grave. The thought came gently and stealthily, and it seemed long before it attained full appreciation, but just as my spirit came at length properly to feel and entertain it, the figures of the judges vanished, as if magically, from before me. The tall candles sank into nothingness, their flames went out utterly, the blackness of darkness supervened. All sensations appeared swallowed up in a mad rushing descent, as of the soul into Hades. Then silence and stillness, night were the universe. I had swooned, but still will not say that all of consciousness was lost. What of it there remained I will not attempt to define, or even to describe, yet all was not lost. In the deepest slumber, no, in delirium, no, in a swoon, no, in death, no, even in the grave all is not lost, else there is no immortality for man. Arousing from the most profound of slumbers, we break the gossamer web of some dream. Yet in a second afterward, so frail may that web have been, we remember not that we have dreamed. In the return to life from the swoon there are two stages. First, that of the sense of mental or spiritual. Secondly, that of the sense of physical existence. It seems probable that if, upon reaching the second stage, we could recall the impressions of the first, we should find these impressions eloquent in the memories of the gulf beyond. And that gulf is what? How at least shall we distinguish its shadows from those of the tomb? But if the impressions of what I have termed the first stage are not at will recalled, yet after a long interval do they not come unbidden whilst we marvel whence they come? He who has never swooned is not he who finds strange places and wildly familiar faces in coals that glow, is not he who beholds floating in mid-air the sad visions that the many may not view? Is not he who ponders over the perfume of some novel flower? Is not he whose brain grows bewildered with the meaning of some musical cadence which has never before arrested his attention? Amid frequent and thoughtful endeavours to remember, amid earnest struggles to regather some token of the state of seeming nothingness into which my soul had lapsed, there have been moments when I have dreamed of success, there have been brief, very brief periods when I have conjured up remembrances which the lucid reason of a later epoch assures me could have reference only to that condition of seeming unconsciousness. These shadows of memory tell indistinctly of tall figures that lifted and bore me in silence down, down, still down, till a hideous dizziness oppressed me at the mere idea of the interminableness of the descent. 
They tell also of a vague horror at my heart, on account of that heart's unnatural stillness. Then comes a sense of sudden motionless throughout all things, as if those who bore me, a ghastly train, had outrun in their descent the limits of the limitless, and paused from the wearisomeness of their toil. After this I call to mind flatness and dampness, and then all is madness, the madness of a memory which busies itself among forbidden things. Very suddenly there came back to my soul motion and sound, the tumultuous motion of the heart, and, in my ears, the sound of its beating. Then a pause in which all is blank, then again sound and motion and touch, a tingling sensation pervading my frame, then the mere consciousness of existence, without thought, a condition which lasted long, then, very suddenly, thought, and shuddering terror, and earnest endeavour to comprehend my true state, then a strong desire to lapse into insensibility, then a rushing revival of soul, and a successful effort to move, and now a full memory of the trial, of the judges, of the sable draperies, of the sentence, of the sickness, of the swoon, then entire forgetfulness of all that followed, of all that a later day and much earnestness of endeavour have enabled me vaguely to recall. So far I had not opened my eyes. I felt that I lay upon my back, unbound. I reached out my hand, and it fell heavily upon something damp and hard. There I suffered it to remain for many minutes, while I strove to imagine where and what I could be. I longed, yet dared, not to employ my vision. I dreaded the first glance at objects around me. It was not that I feared to look upon things horrible, but that I grew aghast lest there should be nothing to see. At length, with a wild desperation at heart, I quickly unclosed my eyes. My worst thoughts, then, were confirmed. The blackness of eternal night encompassed me. I struggled for breath. The intensity of the darkness seemed to oppress and stifle me. The atmosphere was intolerably close. I still lay quietly and made effort to exercise my reason. I brought to mind the inquisitorial proceedings, and attempted from that point to deduce my real condition. The sentence had passed, and it appeared to me that a very long interval of time had since elapsed, yet not for a moment did I suppose myself actually dead. Such a supposition, notwithstanding what we read in fiction, is altogether inconsistent with real existence. But where and in what state was I? The condemned to death, I knew, perished usually at the autos de fe, and one of those had been held on the very night of the day of my trial. Had I been remanded to my dungeon to await the next sacrifice, which would not take place for many months? This I at once saw could not be. Victims had been in immediate demand. Moreover, my dungeon, as well as all the condemned cells at Toledo, had stone floors, and light was not altogether excluded. A fearful idea now suddenly drove the blood in torrents upon my heart, and for a brief period I once more relapsed into insensibility. Upon recovering, I at once started to my feet, trembling convulsively in every fibre. I thrust my arms wildly above and around me in all directions. I felt nothing, yet dreaded to move a step lest I should be impeded by the walls of a tomb. Perspiration burst from every pore and stood in cold big beads upon my forehead. The agony of suspense grew at length intolerable, and I cautiously moved forward with my arms extended and my eyes straining from their sockets, in the hope of catching some faint ray of light. I proceeded for many paces, but still all was blackness and vacancy. I breathed more freely. It seemed evident that mine was not, at least, the most hideous of fates. And now, as I still continued to step cautiously onward, there came a thronging upon my recollection, a thousand vague rumours of the horrors of Toledo. Of the dungeons there had been strange things narrated, fables I had always deemed them, but yet strange and too ghastly to repeat save in a whisper. Was I left to perish of starvation in this subterranean world of darkness, or what fate, perhaps, even more fearful, awaited me? That the result would be death, and a death of more than customary bitterness, I knew too well the character of my judges to doubt. The mode and the hour were all that occupied or distracted me. My outstretched hands at length encountered some solid obstruction. It was a wall, seemingly of stone masonry, very smooth, slimy and cold. I followed it up, stepping with all the careful distrust with which certain antique narratives had inspired me, 
This process, however, afforded me no means of ascertaining the dimensions of my dungeon, as I might make its circuit and return to the point whence I set out, without being aware of the fact so perfectly uniform seemed the wall. I therefore sought the knife which had been in my pocket, when led into the inquisitorial chamber, but it was gone. My clothes had been exchanged for a wrapper of coarse serge. I had thought of forcing the blade in some minute crevice of the masonry, so as to identify my point of departure. The difficulty, nevertheless, was but trivial, although in the disorder of my fancy it seemed at first insufferable. I tore a part of the hem from the robe and placed the fragment at full length and at right angles to the wall. In groping my way around the prison I could not fail to encounter this rag upon completing the circuit. So at least I thought, but I had not counted upon the extent of the dungeon or upon my own weakness. The ground was moist and slippery. I staggered onward for some time, when I stumbled and fell. My excessive fatigue induced me to remain prostrate, and sleep soon overtook me as I lay. Upon awaking and stretching forth an arm, I found beside me a loaf and a pitcher with water. I was too much exhausted to reflect upon this circumstance, but ate and drank with avidity. Shortly afterward I resumed my tour around the prison, and with much toil came at last upon the fragment of the surge. Up to the period when I fell I had counted fifty-two paces, and upon resuming my walk I had counted forty-eight more, when I arrived at the rag. There were in all then a hundred paces, and, admitting two paces to the yard, I presumed the dungeon to be fifty yards in circuit. I had met, however, with many angles in the wall, and thus I could form no guess at the shape of a vault, for vault I could not help supposing it to be. I had little object, certainly no hope, in these researches, but a vague curiosity prompted me to continue them. Quitting the wall I resolved to cross the area of the enclosure. At first I proceeded with extreme caution, for the floor, although seemingly of solid material, was treacherous with slime. At length, however, I took courage, and did not hesitate to step firmly, endeavouring to cross in as direct a line as possible. I had advanced some ten or twelve paces in this manner, when the remnant of the torn hem of my robe became entangled between my legs. I stepped on it and fell violently on my face. In the confusion attending my fall, I did not immediately apprehend a somewhat startling circumstance, which yet, in a few seconds afterward, and while I still lay prostrate, arrested my attention. It was this. My chin rested upon the floor of the prison, but my lips and the upper portion of my head, although seemingly at a less elevation than the chin, touched nothing. At the same time my forehead seemed bathed in a clammy vapour, and the peculiar smell of decayed fungus arose to my nostrils. I put forward my arm and shuddered to find that I had fallen at the very brink of a circular pit, whose extent, of course, I had no means of ascertaining at the moment. Groping about the masonry just below the margin, I succeeded in dislodging a small fragment and let it fall into the abyss. For many seconds I hearkened to its reverberations as it dashed against the sides of the chasm in its descent. At length there was a sullen plunge into water, succeeded by loud echoes. At the same moment there came a sound resembling the quick opening and as rapid closing of a door overhead while a faint gleam of light flashed suddenly through the gloom, and as suddenly faded away. I saw clearly the doom which had been prepared for me, and congratulated myself upon the timely accident by which I had escaped. Another step before my fall and the world had seen me no more, and the death just avoided was of that very character which I had regarded as fabulous and frivolous in the tales respecting the Inquisition. To the victims of its tyranny, there was the choice of death with its direct physical agonies, or death with its most hideous moral horrors. I had been reserved for the latter. By long suffering my nerves had been unstrung until I trembled at the sound of my own voice, and had become in every respect a fitting subject for the species of torture which awaited me. Shaking in every limb I groped my way back to the wall, resolving there to perish rather than risk the terrors of the wells, of which my imagination now pictured many in various positions about the dungeon. In other conditions of mind I might have had courage to end my misery at once by a plunge into one of these abysses, but now I was the veriest of cowards. Neither could I forget what I had read of these pits, that the sudden extinction of life formed no part of their most horrible plan. Agitation of spirit kept me awake for many long hours, but at length I again slumbered. 
Upon arousing, I found by my side, as before, a loaf and a pitcher of water. A burning thirst consumed me, and I emptied the vessel at a draught. It must have been drugged, for scarcely had I drunk before I became irresistibly drowsy. A deep sleep fell upon me, a sleep like that of death. How long it lasted, of course, I know not, but when once again I unclosed my eyes, the objects around me were visible. By a wild sulphurous lustre, the origin of which I could not at first determine, I was enabled to see the extent and aspect of the prison. In its size I had been greatly mistaken. The whole circuit of its walls did not exceed twenty-five yards. For some minutes this fact occasioned me a world of vain trouble. Vain, indeed, for what could be of less importance under the terrible circumstances which environed me than the mere dimensions of my dungeon? But my soul took a wild interest in trifles, and I busied myself in endeavours to account for the error I had committed in my measurement. The truth at length flashed upon me. In my first attempt at exploration I had counted fifty-two paces, up to the period when I fell. I must have then been within a pace or two of the fragment of surge. In fact, I had neatly performed the circuit of the vault. I then slept, and upon awaking I must have returned upon my steps, thus supposing the circuit nearly double what it actually was. My confusion of mind prevented me from observing that I began my tour with the wall to the left, and ended it with the wall to the right. I had been deceived, too, in respect to the shape of the enclosure. In feeling my way I had found many angles, and thus deduced an idea of great irregularity, so potent is the effect of total darkness upon one arousing from lethargy or sleep. The angles were simply those of a few slight depressions or niches at odd intervals. The general shape of the prison was square. What I had taken for masonry seemed now to be iron, or some other metal, in huge plates whose sutures or joints occasioned the depression. The entire surface of this metallic enclosure was rudely daubed in all the hideous and repulsive devices to which the charnel superstition of the monks has given rise. The figures of fiends in aspects of menace, with skeleton forms and other more really fearful images, overspread and disfigured the walls. I observed that the outlines of these monstrosities were sufficiently distinct, but that the colours seemed faded and blurred, as if from the effects of a damp atmosphere. I now noticed the floor, too, which was of stone. In the centre yawned the circular pit from whose jaws I had escaped, but it was the only one in the dungeon. All this I saw indistinctly, and by much effort, for my personal condition had been greatly changed during slumber. I now lay upon my back and at full length on a species of low framework of wood. To this I was securely bound by a long strap resembling a surcingle. It passed in many convolutions about my limbs and body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm to such extent that I could, by dint of much exertion, supply myself with food from an earthen dish which lay by my side on the floor. I saw, too, to my horror, that the pitcher had been removed. I say to my horror, for I was consumed with intolerable thirst. This thirst, it appeared, to be the design of my persecutors to stimulate, for the food in the dish was meat pungently seasoned. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some thirty or forty feet overhead, and constructed much as the side walls. In one of its panels a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was the painted figure of time, as he is commonly represented, save that in lieu of a scythe he held what at a casual glance I supposed to be the pictured image of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. There was something, however, in the appearance of this machine, which caused me to regard it more attentively. When I gazed directly upward at it, for its position was immediately over my own, I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant afterwards the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief, and of course slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. Wearied at length with observing its dull movement, I turned my eyes upon the other objects in the cell. A slight noise attracted my notice, and looking to the floor I saw several enormous rats traversing it. They had issued from the well, which lay just within view to my right. Even then, while I gazed, they came up in troops, hurriedly, with ravenous eyes, allured by the scent of the meat. From this it required much effort and attention to scare them away. 
It might have been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, for I could take but imperfect note of time, before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity was also much greater, but what mainly disturbed me was the idea that had perceptibly descended. I now observed, with what horror it is needless to say, that its nether extremity was formed of a crescent of glittering steel, about a foot in length from horn to horn, the horns upward, and the under edge evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor also it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid and broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass, and the whole hissed as it swung through the air. I could no longer doubt the doom prepared for me by monkish ingenuity in torture. My cognizance of the pit had become known to the inquisitorial agents, the pit whose horrors had been destined for so bold a recusant as myself, the pit typical of hell and regarded by rumour as the ultimate fuel of all their punishments. The plunge into this pit I had avoided by the merest of accidents. I knew that surprise or entrapment into torment formed an important portion of all the grotesquerie of these dungeon deaths. Having failed to fall, it was no part of the demon plan to hurl me into the abyss, and thus, there being no alternative, a different and a milder destruction awaited me. Milder! I half smiled in my agony as I thought of such application of such term. What boots it to tell of the long, long hours of horror more than mortal, during which I counted the rushing vibrations of that steel, inch by inch, line by line, with a descent only appreciable at intervals that seemed ages. Down and still down it came. Days passed. It might have been that many days passed, ere it swept so closely over me as to fan me with its acrid breath. The odour of the sharp steel forced itself into my nostrils. I prayed. I wearied heaven with my prayer for its more speedy descent. I grew frantically mad, and struggled to force myself upwards against the sweep of the fearful scimitar. And then I fell suddenly calm, and lay smiling at the glittering death, as a child at some rare bauble. There was another interval of utter insensibility. It was brief, for upon again lapsing into life there had been no perceptible descent in the pendulum. But it might have been long, for I knew there were demons who took note of my swoon, and who could have arrested the vibration at pleasure. Upon my recovery, too, I felt very oh, inexpressibly sick and weak, as if through long inanition. Even amid the agonies of that period, the human nature craved food. With painful effort I outstretched my left arm as far as my bonds permitted, and took possession of the small remnant which had been spared me by the rats. As I put a portion of it within my lips, there rushed to my mind a half-formed thought of joy, of hope. Yet what business had I with hope? It was, as I say, a half-formed thought. Man has many such which are never completed. I felt that it was of joy, of hope, but felt also that it had perished in its formation. In vain I struggled to perfect, to regain it. Long suffering had nearly annihilated all my ordinary powers of mind. I was an imbecile, an idiot. The vibration of the pendulum was at right angles to my length. I saw that the crescent was designed to cross the region of the heart. It would fray the surge of my robe. It would return and repeat its operations again and again, notwithstanding terrifically wide sweep. Some thirty feet or more, and the hissing vigour of its descent, sufficient to sunder these very walls of iron, still the fraying of my robe would be all that, for several minutes, it would accomplish. And at this thought I paused. I dared not to go further than this reflection. I dwelt upon it with a pertinacity of attention, as if in so dwelling I could arrest here the descent of the steel. I forced myself to ponder upon the sound of the crescent as it should pass across the garment, upon the peculiar thrilling sensation which the friction of cloth produces on the nerves. I pondered upon all this frivolity until my teeth were on edge. Down, steadily down, it crept. I took a frenzied pleasure in contrasting its downward with its lateral velocity, to the right, to the left, far and wide, with the shriek of a damned spirit, to my heart with the stealthy pace of the tiger. I alternately laughed and howled as the one or the other idea grew predominant. 
down, certainly relentlessly down. It vibrated within three inches of my bosom. I struggled violently, furiously to free my left arm. This was free only from the elbow to the hand. I could reach the latter from the platter beside me to my mouth with great effort, but no farther. Could I have broken the fastenings above the elbow? I would have seized and attempted to arrest the pendulum. I might as well have attempted to arrest an avalanche, down that still unceasingly, still inevitably down. I gasped and struggled at each vibration. I shrunk convulsively at its every sweep. My eyes followed its outward or upward whirls with the eagerness of the most unmeaning despair. They closed themselves spasmodically at the descent, although death would have been a relief. Oh, how unspeakable! Still I quivered in every nerve to think how slight a sinking of the machinery would precipitate that keen, glistening axe upon my bosom. It was hope that prompted the nerves to quiver, the frame to shrink. It was hope, the hope that triumphs on the rack that whispers to the death condemned even in the dungeons of the Inquisition. I saw that some ten or twelve vibrations would bring the steel in actual contact with my robe, and with this observation there suddenly came over my spirit all the keen, collected calmness of despair. For the first time during many hours, or perhaps days, I thought, it now occurred to me that the bandage or surcingle which enveloped me was unique. I was tied by no separate cord. The first stroke of the razor-like crescent athwart any portion of the band would so detach it that it might be unwound from my person by means of my left hand. But how fearful in that case the proximity of the steel, the result of the slightest struggle, how deadly! Was it likely, moreover, that the minions of the torturer had not foreseen and provided for this possibility? Was it probable that the bandage crossed my bosom in the track of the pendulum? Dreading to find my faint, and, as it seemed, my last hope frustrated, I so far elevated my head as to obtain a distinct view of my breast. The surcingle enveloped my limbs and body close in all directions, save in the path of the destroying crescent. Scarcely as I dropped my head back into its original position, when there flashed upon my mind what I cannot better describe than as the unformed half of that idea of deliverance to which I have previously alluded, and of which a moiety only floated indeterminately through my brain when I raised food to my burning lips. The whole thought was now present, feeble, scarcely sane, scarcely definite, but still entire. I proceeded at once with the nervous energy of despair to attempt its execution. For many hours the immediate vicinity of the low framework upon which I lay had been literally swarming with rats. They were wild, bold, ravenous, their red eyes glaring upon me as if they waited but for motionlessness on my part to make me their prey. To what food, I thought, have they been accustomed in the well? They had devoured, in spite of all my efforts to prevent them, all but a small remnant of the contents of the dish. I had fallen into a habitual seesaw or wave of the hand about the platter, and at length the unconscious uniformity of the movement deprived it of effect. In their veracity the vermin frequently fastened their sharp fangs in my fingers. With the particles of the oily and spicy viand which now remained, I thoroughly rubbed the bandage wherever I could reach it. Then, raising my hand from the floor, I lay breathlessly still. At first the ravenous animals were startled and terrified at the change, at the cessation of movement. They shrank alarmedly back. Many sought the well. But this was only for a moment. I had not counted in vain upon their veracity. Observing that I remained without motion, one or two of the boldest leaped upon the framework and smelt at the surcingle. This seemed the signal for a general rush. Forth from the well they hurried in fresh troops. They clung to the wood. They overran it and leaped in hundreds upon my person. The measured movement of the pendulum disturbed them not at all. Avoiding its strokes, they busied themselves with the anointed bandage. They pressed. They swarmed upon me in ever-accumulating heaps. They writhed upon my throat. Their cold lips sought my own. I was half stifled by their thronging pressure. Disgust, for which the world has no name, swelled my bosom and chilled with a heavy clamminess my heart. Yet one minute and I felt that the struggle would be over. Plainly I perceived the loosening of the bandage. I knew that in more than one place it must be already severed. With a more than human resolution I lay still. Nor had I erred in my calculations, nor had I endured in vain. 
I at length felt that I was free. The surcingle hung in ribbons from my body. But the stroke of the pendulum already pressed upon my bosom. It had divided the surge of the robe. It had cut through the linen beneath. Twice again it swung, and a sharp sense of pain shot through every nerve. But the moment of escape had arrived. At a wave of my hand my deliverers hurried tumultuously away. With a steady movement, cautious, sidelong, shrinking and slow, I slid from the embrace of the bandage and beyond the reach of the scimitar. For the moment, at least, I was free. Free, and in the grasp of the Inquisition. I had scarcely stepped from my wooden bed of horror upon the stone floor of the prison when the motion of the hellish machine ceased, and I beheld it drawn up by some invisible force through the ceiling. This was a lesson which I took desperately to heart. My every motion was undoubtedly watched. Free, I had but escaped death in one form of agony, to be delivered unto worse than death in some other. With that thought I rolled my eyes nervously around on the barriers of iron that hemmed me in. Something unusual, some change which at first I could not appreciate distinctly, it was obvious had taken place in the apartment. For many minutes of a dreamy and trembling abstraction, I busied myself in vain, unconnected conjecture. During this period I became aware for the first time of the origin of the sulphurous light which illumined the cell. It proceeded from a fissure about half an inch in width, extending entirely around the prison at the base of the walls, which thus appeared and were completely separated from the floor. I endeavoured, but of course in vain, to look through the aperture. As I arose from the attempt, the mystery of the alteration in the chamber broke at once upon my understanding. I have observed that, although the outlines of the figures upon the walls were sufficiently distinct, yet the colours seemed blurred and indefinite. These colours had now assumed, and were momentarily assuming, a startling and most intense brilliancy that gave to the spectral and fiendish portraitures an aspect that might have thrilled even firmer nerves than my own. Demon eyes of a wild and ghastly vivacity glared upon me in a thousand directions, where none had been visible before, and gleamed with the lurid lustre of a fire that I could not force my imagination to regard as unreal. Unreal, even while I breathed, there came to my nostrils the breath of the vapour of heated iron. A suffocating odour pervaded the prison. A deeper glow settled each movement in the eyes that glared at my agonies. A richer tint of crimson diffused itself over the pitcher's horrors of blood. I panted, I gasped with breath. There could be no doubt of the design of my tormentors, O oh, most unrelenting, O oh, most demoniac of men. I shrank from the glowing metal to the centre of the cell. Amid the thought of the fiery destruction that impended, the idea of the coolness of the well came over my soul like a balm. I rushed to its deadly brink, I threw my straining vision below. The glare from the enkindled roof illumined its innermost recesses. Yet for a wild moment did my spirit refuse to comprehend the meaning of what I saw. At length it forced, it wrestled its way into my soul, it burned itself in upon my shuddering reason. Oh, for a voice to speak! Oh, horror! Oh, any horror but this! With a shriek I rushed from the margin and buried my face in my hands, weeping bitterly. The heat rapidly increased, and once again I looked up, shuddering as with a fit of the arg. There had been a second change in the cell, and now the change was obviously in the form, as before it was in vain that I, at first, endeavoured to appreciate or understand what was taking place. But not long was I left in doubt. The inquisitorial vengeance had been hurried by my twofold escape, and there was to be no more dallying with the King of Terrors. The room had been square. I saw that two of its iron angles were now acute, two consequently obtuse. The fearful difference quickly increased with a low rumbling or moaning sound. In an instant the apartment had shifted its form into that of a lozenge. But the alteration stopped not here. I neither hoped nor desired it to stop. I could have clasped the red walls to my bosom as a garment of eternal peace. Death, I said, any death but that of the pit. Fool, might I have not known that into the pit it was the object of the burning iron to urge me? Could I not resist its glow? Or, if even that, could I withstand its pressure? And now, flatter and flatter grew the lozenge, with a rapidity that left me no time for contemplation. Its centre, and of course its greatest width, came just over the yawning gulf. I shrank back, 
but the closing walls pressed me resistlessly onwards. At length, for my seared and writhing body, there was no longer an inch of foothold on the firm floor of the prison. I struggled no more, but the agony of my soul found vent in one loud, long, and final scream of despair. I felt that I tottered upon the brink, I averted my eyes. There was a discordant hum of human voices. There was a loud blast as of many trumpets. There was a harsh grating as of a thousand thunders. The fiery walls rushed back, an outstretched arm caught my own as I fell fainting into the abyss. It was that of General Lascelle. The French army has entered Toledo. The Inquisition was in the hands of its enemies. End of section 11 The Pit and the Pendulum Section 12 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roseanne Hoffman, Youngstown, Ohio. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 12. The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer, "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then the ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, 
ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore quoth the raven nevermore much i marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly though its answer little meaning little relevancy bore for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such a name as nevermore but the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only that one word as if its soul in that one word he did outpour nothing farther than he uttered not a feather than he fluttered till i scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before on the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before then the bird said nevermore startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken doubtless said i what it utters is its only stock and store caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never never more but the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling straight i wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door then upon the velvet sinking i betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy thinking what this ominous bird of yore what this grim ungainly ghastly gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore this i sat engaged in guessing but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core this and more i sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press ah uh, nevermore then methought the air grew denser perfumed from an unseen censer swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor wretch i cried thy god hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee respite respite and nepenthe from thy memories of lenore quaff o oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost lenore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil whether tempter set or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted on this home by horror haunted tell me truly i implore is there is there balm in gilead tell me tell me i implore quoth the raven nevermore prophet said i thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil by that heaven that bends above us by that god we both adore tell this soul with sorrow laden if within the distant eden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name lenore clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name lenore quoth the raven nevermore be that our sign of parting bird or fiend i shrieked upstarting get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken leave my loneliness unbroken quit the bust above my door take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door quoth the raven nevermore and the raven never flitting still is sitting still is sitting on the pallid bust of pallas just above my chamber door and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadows on the floor and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor 
shall be lifted nevermore. End of section 12, The Raven. Section 13 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 13. Alone. From childhood's hour I have not been, as others were, I have not seen. As others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source I have not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken, my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Thou, in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn, from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still, from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form, when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. End of section 13. Alone. Section 14 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 14. Dreamland. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have reached these lands but newly from an ultimate dim thule, from a wild weird clime that lieth sublime out of space, out of time. Bottomless vales and boundless floods, in chasms and caves and titan woods, with forms that no man can discover, for the dews that dripple over, mountains toppling evermore into seas without a shore, seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire, lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters lone and dead, their still waters still and chilly with the snows of the lolling lily, by the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters lone and dead, their sad waters sad and chilly with the snows of the lolling lily, by the mountains near the river murmuring lowly, murmuring ever, by the grey woods, by the swamp, where the toad and the newt encamp, by the dismal tarns and pools where dwell the ghouls, by each spot the most unholy, in each nook most melancholy, there the traveller meets aghast, sheeted memories of the past, shrouded forms that start and sigh as they pass the wanderer by, white-robed forms of friends long given, in agony to the earth and heaven. For the heart whose woes are legion, tis a peaceful, soothing region, for the spirit that walks in shadow, tis, oh, tis an El Dorado, but the traveller travelling through it may not, dare not, openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed. So wills its king, who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid. And thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it through darkened glasses. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an Eidolon named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim thule. End of section 14. Dreamland. Section 15 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 15. To one in paradise. Thou wast that all to me, love, for which my soul did pine. A green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine. All wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Our dream too bright to last, a starry hope that didst arise, but to be overcast. 
A voice from out the future cries, On, on, but o'er the past. Dim gulf, my spirit hovering lies, Mute, motionless, aghast. For alas, alas, with me, The light of life is o'er, No more, no more, no more. Such language holds the solemn sea To the sands upon the shore. Shall bloom the thunder-blasted tree, Or the stricken eagle soar? And all my days are trances, And all my nightly dreams, are where thy dark eye glances, and where thy footstep gleams, in what ethereal dances, by what eternal streams. Alas for that accursed time, they bore thee o'er the billow, from love to titled age and crime, and an unholy pillow, from me and from our misty clime, where weeps the silver willow. End of section 15. To one in paradise. Section 16 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 16. Romance. Romance who loves to nod and sing with drowsy head and folded wing among the green leaves as they shake far down within some shadowy lake, to me a painted paroquet, hath been a most familiar bird, taught me my alphabet to say, to lisp my very earliest word, while in the wild wood I did lie, a child with a most knowing eye, of late eternal condor years, so shake the very heaven on high, with tumult as they thunder by, I have no time for idle cares, though gazing on the unquiet sky, and when an owl with calmer wings its down upon my spirit flings, that little time with lyre and rhyme to while away forbidden things, my heart would feel to be a crime unless it trembled with the strings. End of section 16. Romance. Section 17 of Miscellaneous Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 17. The Valley of Unrest. Once it smiled a silent dell where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto the wars, trusting to the mild eyed stars nightly from their azure towers to keep watch above the flowers in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness nothing there is motionless nothing save the airs that brood over the magic solitude ah by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas around the misty hebrides Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that rustle through the unquiet heaven, unceasingly from morn till even over the violets there that lie, in myriad types of the human eye, over the lilies that wave and weep above a nameless grave. They wave from out their fragrant tops, eternal dews come down in drops, they weep from off their delicate stems, perennial tears descend in gems. End of section 17 the Valley of Unrest Section 18 of Miscellaneous Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 18 A Dream Within a Dream Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow, you are not wrong who deem, that my days have been a dream, yet if hope has flown away, in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone, all that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand, how few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? 
O God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? End of section 18 A Dream Within a Dream Section 19 of Miscellaneous Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryony Ford. Miscellaneous Poe by Edgar Allan Poe. Section 19. Eulaloom. The skies, they were ashen and sober. The leaves, they were crisped and sear. The leaves, they were withering and sear. It was night in the lonesome October of my most immemorial year. It was hard by the dim lake of Alba, in the misty mid-region of Weir. It was down by the dank tarn of Alba, in the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. Here once through an alley titanic, of Cyprus I roamed with my soul, of Cyprus with Psyche my soul. These were the days when my heart was volcanic, as the scoriac rivers that roll, as the lavas that restlessly roll, their sulfurious currents down Yarnek in the ultimate climes of the pole they groan as they roll down mount yarnock in the realms of the boreal pole our talk had been serious and sober but our thoughts they were palsied and sear our memories were treacherous and sear for we knew not the month was october and we marked not the night of the year our night of all nights in the year we noted not the dim lake of alba though once we had journeyed down here Remembered not the dark tarn of Alba, nor the ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. And now as the night was senescent, and star-dials pointed to morn, as the sun-dials hinted of morn, at the end of our path a liquescent and nebulous lustre was born, out of which a miraculous crescent arose with a duplicate horn, a starty's bediamond crescent, distinct with its duplicate horn, and I said she is warmer than Diane, she rolls through an ether of sighs, she revels in a region of sighs, she has seen that the tears are not dry on these cheeks where the worm never dies, and has come past the stars of the lion to point us the path to the skies, to the Lethean peace of the skies, come up in despite of the lion to shine on us with her bright eyes, come up through the lair of the lion with love in her luminous eyes. But Psyche, uplifting her finger, said sadly this star I mistrust, her pallor I strangely mistrust. O oh, hasten, O oh, let us not linger, O oh, fly, let us fly, for we must. In terror she spoke, letting sink her wings till they trailed in the dust. In agony sobbed, letting sink her plumes till they trailed in the dust, till they sorrowfully trailed in the dust. I replied, this is nothing but dreaming, let us on by this tremulous light, let us bathe in this crystalline light. Its sibyllic splendour is beaming with hope and in beauty to-night. See, it flickers up in the sky through the night. Are we safely may trust to its gleaming, and be sure it will lead us aright? We safely may trust to a gleaming that cannot but guide us aright, since it flickers up to heaven through the night. Thus I pacified Psyche and kissed her, and tempted her out of her gloom, and conquered her scruples and gloom, and we passed to the end of a vista, but were stopped by the door of a tomb, by the door of a legended tomb. And I said, What is written, sweet sister, on the door of this legended tomb? She replied, Eulaloom, Eulaloom, tis the vault of thy lost Eulaloom. Then my heart it grew ashen and sober, as the leaves that were crisped and sear, as the leaves that were withering and sear. And I cried, it was surely October, on this very night of last year, that I journeyed, I journeyed down here, that I brought a dread burden down here, on this night of all nights in the year, and what demon has tempted me here? Well, I know now this dim lake of Alba, this misty mid-region of Weir, well, I know now this dank tarn of Alba, this ghoul-haunted woodland of Weir. End of section 19. Eulaloom. Thanks for visiting Timeless Audiobooks. Please remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for our latest audiobook uploads.